common accusation aimed at the LGBT movement, which is that the movement is trying to normalize pedophilia. The accusation is that using softer terms like intergenerational relations and describing pedophilia as another sexual orientation and couching defense of pedophile rights in the discussion of gay rights is a way to insidiously promote the legalization of pedophilia and child pornography by linking gay rights to sexual liberation in all its forms. Now, most people will roll their eyes at such an accusation and assert that those accusations are baseless talking points put out by Christian conservatives who are trying to demonize gay people. Is it just a baseless homophobic trope? Are there any statements or arguments by the major figures in postmodern and queer theory which support these arguments? Is there a difference between the types of freedoms that the gay activist community in general is trying to achieve and those which end up coming under the umbrella of queer theory and its tendency to transgress all social norms. Well, feminists who are presently disparaged as trans-exclusionary radical feminists, you've heard them called TERFs, are generally skeptical of the philosophical assertions of queer theory. One such feminist, going by the name of Dr. M., detailed the reasons for her caution in a series of essays citing the original writings of major figures in the queer theory movement. The original Medium.com articles written by Dr. M were censored and removed from the platform. This video is an audio essay reading of this series of posts, which dive into four key figures in postmodern philosophy and its subsequent school of thought, queer theory, and how they have, adju how they have addressed the issue of the age of consent, adult child sex, and images of child sexual abuse. The four figures are Michel Foucault, Gail Rubin, Pat Califia, and Judith Butler. And the essay is in four parts, each of which will focus on one of these major figures. You can see the original arc articles and citations from Dr. M in a link which is contained in the video description. So we'll go ahead and take a look at part one. Under the title, The Trojan Unicorn, Queer Theory, and Pedophilia, queer theory is based on, on an interpretation of power which claims that children can consent to sex with adults. Dr. M. investigates. The article starts out with just a few screenshots from tweets where feminist outlets are celebrating something labeled as queer feminism. And the more you look into this, you more you see that the feminist community is not a monolith. There are different waves of feminism and different schools of thought associated with each wave. Generally, it's the second wave feminists, which are labeled TERFs, um, because they have a great deal of skepticism about queer theory and how it changed the activist element of feminism and the principles which it espouses. And you'll get more into this as we go into the article. But we'll go ahead and start with our reading at the beginning, at the introduction. Introduction. When I see the term queer feminist or queer feminism, I suspect, maybe hope, that those using those descriptors have not done the reading. As the old proverb states, the road to hell is lined with good intentions. I do not believe that all these young woke people, charities, institutions, and art festivals are supportive of rape and pedophilia of queering and transgressing boundaries feminists have worked tirelessly to establish. Nevertheless, this is what queer theory aims at. As Sarah Beresford has analyzed, the term queer is by definition whatever is at odds with the normal, the legitimate, and the dominant, and aims to destabilize dominant ideas of identity, whether that identity is sexual, gendered, ethnic, national, and political, and so forth. This sounds liberating and progressive until we remember that the normal, the legitimate, and the dominant include the idea that adults should not sexually abuse children. Unnervingly, the reframing of child sexual abuse and liberating of pedophilia from the margins of society is a dominant idea within queer theory. Although it has attempted to cloak itself under the rainbow, and harness the energy, goodwill, and gains gay, lesbian, and bisexual people have fought for over decades. Queer theory is anything but progressive. Indeed, it is totally opposed to same-sex attraction. As Professor Alessandra Tanasini outlines, 
A characteristic of queer theory is its opposition to any view that treats sexual orientation as anything other than socially constructed. Thus, same-sex attraction becomes a preference which can be unlearned or cast as bigoted for being exclusionary. This is homophobia in a shiny new case. Unlike transgender ideology, which is underpinned by queer theory, queer theory has key proponents and a body of literature which we may interrogate. This series of essays will first look at the postmodern foundations before moving on to queer theory and pedophilia. Postmodernist Underpinning of Queer Theory Queer theory was built on the philosophical traditions known as poststructuralism and postmodernism. Michel Foucault was the founding father of this new way of conceptualizing reality and the human condition. Tamsim Spargo has claimed that Foucault's analysis of the interrelationship of knowledge, power, and sexuality was the most important intellectual catalyst of queer theory. Similarly, Margaret A. McLaren has asserted that Foucault's work has been foundational to queer theory. Foucault advanced the idea that power is relational and ubiquitous. Rather than being dictated from above and unilateral, Foucault claimed that power and prohibition was movable and pervasive, being constructed through discourse. As Jane Clara Jones has explained, Foucault suggested that discursive regimes, as regimes of power knowledge, produce the subjects they purport to describe. In practice, this means that the harm of rape, for example, is how we discursively construct a victim and an offender rather than the physical act of rape itself. Furthermore, Foucault posited that the notion that fundamental or real structures underpinned events or materials such as texts was a fallacy. Foucault's reconceptualization of the triad of discourse, power, and knowledge entailed a rethinking of resistance. Transgression of norms and, in particular, sexual norms, became the only response to punishment and classification which would, in Foucauldian thinking, challenge oppression and power. Although Foucault's challenge to heteronormative dominance was a welcome intervention, the extension of his idea that all norms are bad and freeing repressed deviant sexualities is good in and of itself poses serious problems. Feminists have attempted to develop the cultural norm that rape is bad and that children cannot consent to sexual activity. These activities, rape and child sexual abuse, become reframed in postmodernism and therefore queer theory as repressed and a transgression of boundaries which is thus challenging power and helping to liberate the individual. For example, Foucault presented the prosecution of a child molester as a petty collective intolerance where the discourse constructs an offender and victim and it enacts state power on an individual. Foucault related how, quote, One day in 1867, a farmhand from the village of Lapcourt, who was somewhat simple-minded, employed here than there depending on the season, living hand-to-mouth from a little charity or in exchange for the worst sort of labor, sleeping in barns and stables, was turned in to the authorities. At the border of a field, he had obtained a few caresses from a little girl, just as he had done before and seen done by the village urchins round about him. For at the edge of the wood, or in the ditch by the road leading to St. Nicholas, they would play the familiar game called curdled milk. So he was pointed out by the girl's parents to the mayor of the village, reported by the mayor to the gendarme, led by the gendarme to the judge who indicted him and turned him over first to a doctor and then to two other experts who not only wrote their report, but also had it published. What is the significant thing about this story? The pettiness of it all. The fact that this everyday occurrence in the life of village sexuality, these inconsequential bucolic pleasures, could become, from a certain time, the object not only of collective intolerance, but of a judicial action, a medical intervention, a careful examination, and an entire theoretical elaboration. Close quote. The harm in this scenario, according to Foucault, was the authoritarian investigation, which forced the village halfwit to speak about giving a few pennies to the little girls for favors the older ones refused him. J.C. Jones provides further information of Foucault's treatment of this incident of child sexual abuse. She details how, quote, with the publication of Abnormal, the 1974 to 1975 lectures at the Collège de France, we now know that Foucault's treatment of the case in the history of sexuality was not his first. On this occasion, he gives more detail about the obtained caresses 
than he was willing to put into print, while nonetheless retaining his stance of steadfast obfuscation and assuring his audience that the matter you will see is extremely banal. The farmhand, named amusingly, Foucault imagines, Joey, was, we learn, denounced by the parents of a little girl he had almost partly or more or less raped. The assault occurred on the day of the village festival, when Joey dragged young Sophie Adams, unless it was Sophie Adams who dragged Charles Joey, into the ditch alongside the road to Nancy. There, something happened, almost rape, perhaps. But this is nothing to trouble ourselves about. Joey, you will be reassured, very decently gives four sous to the little girl, who, entirely unperturbed, immediately runs to the fair to buy some roasted almonds. Close quote. Sexual violence and child abuse are extremely banal for Foucault. He presents the giving of money as purchasing the child's consent after the act, and thus changing the reality of the event. The notion that changing the discourse changes the experience and truths is particularly useful for queer theory, which promotes men's sexual rights and pedophilia. Despite the supposed banality of adult sexual activity with children, Foucault remained concerned with the age of consent legislation. In 1977, Foucault signed a petition to the French Parliament arguing for the abolition of all legislation regarding the age of consent, the effective legalization of pedophilia. In 1978, Foucault participated in a radio broadcast which once again argued that age of consent legislation should be abolished and that children's sexuality and supposed desire for sex with adults should be acknowledged. Published as The Danger of Child Sexuality, an interview with Michel Foucault, Following Foucault's introduction, Guy Hawkingham sums up the position of the three male thinkers. Quote, Six months ago, we launched a petition demanding the abrogation of a number of articles in the law, in particular those concerning relations between and decriminalizing of relations between adults and minors below the age of 15. A lot of people signed it, people belonging to a wide range of political positions. Close quote. There, we have a justification for the legalization of pedophilia based on its supposed popularity. This radio broadcast also included a startling defense of videos of child sexual abuse. Hawkingham argued that, quote, When somebody says that child pornography is the most terrible of present scandals, one cannot be struck by the disproportion between this, child pornography, which is not even prostitution, and everything that is happening in the world today, what the black population has to put up with in the United States, for instance. Close quote. Yes. In this broadcast of a conversation between Foucault and two of his contemporaries, it is being argued that because black people suffer racism in America, that the sexual abuse of children should be filmed and distributed. The mind boggles. Foucault responded that, quote, the child with his own sexuality may have desired that adult. He may even have consented. He may even have made the first moves. We may even agree that it was he who seduced the adult. Close quote and claimed that legislation regarding the relations between child and adult sexuality were extremely questionable. That is the founding father of postmodernism and the underpinnings of queer theory. Hawkingham continued the conversation alleging that, quote, there is a whole mixture of notions that makes it possible to fabricate this notion of crime or offense against decency, which comprises both the religious prohibitions concerning sodomy and the completely new notions to which Michel Foucault has just referred, about what people think they know of the total difference between the world of the child and the world of the adult. But today's overall tendency is indisputably not only to fabricate a type of crime that is quite simply the erotic or sensual relationship between a child and an adult. Close quote. Yes, these men publicly argued that adults penetrating children is a fabricated crime because people are ignorant and arrogant in asserting the separation of the world and understanding of a child and an adult. One presumes that their next campaign is for child prime ministers, child intellectuals, and if they need medical care, they will allow a child to perform it. When sexual abusers make the argument that children can understand and enjoy sex with adults, they never carry it over to other aspects of life. This notion of child consent and child focus on activities regarding their genitals is something we see carried over by queer theory in the concept of the transgender child. With such an intellectual pedigree, is it any wonder that alarm bells are ringing? The third speaker, Jean Denet, offers more theorizing on consent and pedophilia. Denet makes the case that, quote, When we say that the problem of consent is quite central in matters concerned with pedophilia, we are not saying that consent is always there. 
But, and this is where one may separate the attitude of the law with regard to rape and with regard to pedophilia. In the case of rape, judges consider that there is a presumption of consent on the part of the woman and that the opposite has to be demonstrated. Whereas where pedophilia is concerned, it's considered that there is a presumption of non-consent, a presumption of violence, even in a case where no charge of an indecent act with violence has been made, that is, with consenting pleasure. Because it has to be said that this act without violence is the repressive legal translation of consenting pleasure. It's pretty clear how the system of proof is manipulated in opposite ways in the case of rape of women and in the case of indecent assault on a minor. Close quote. There is some mighty projection occurring with the notion of consenting pleasure. The two are incomparable. Women have the adult faculties and understanding to engage in sexual activity. Children do not. Foucault was clear that, quote, an age barrier laid down by law does not have much sense. Again, the child may be trusted to say whether or not he was subjected to violence. Close quote. Foucault adds his opinion that, quote, to assume that a child is incapable of explaining what happened and was incapable of giving his consent are two abuses that are intolerable, quite unacceptable. Close quote. There it is. The father of postmodernism and grandfather of queer theory declaring that the idea that a child cannot consent to sexual activity with an adult, cannot sanction their own abuse, is intolerable and unacceptable. How are thinkers proposing such ideas lauded as philosophical geniuses? This reframing of the unacceptable and the notion that language supersedes reality was the mantle which queer theory was to pick up. Trojan Unicorn, Part 2 Queer Theory and pedophilia. The cultural anthropologist Gail Rubin is thought of as one of the core theorists of queer theory, and like Foucault before her, she made the case for the legalization and acceptance of pedophilia, arguing on the grounds of child consent. The University of Pittsburgh has declared that, quote, few thinkers have been as influential to feminist theory, gay and lesbian studies, and queer theory as Gail Rubin, close quote, and that in the late 1970s, she was perhaps the first to notice the importance of Michel Foucault's history of sexuality, which one decade later would arguably be the most influential work on early queer theory. The University Library of Illinois posited that, quote, Gail Rubin's essay, Thinking Sex, is often identified as one of the fundamental texts, and it continues Foucault's rejection of biological explanations of sexuality by thinking about the way that sexual identities, as well as behaviors, are hierarchically organized through systems of sexual classification, close quote. Along with Foucault, Rubin took a constructionist approach to sexuality. The constructionist approach has been useful in radical feminist critiques of heteronormative sexuality, the notion that normal sex is when the man is dominant and the woman submissive. It has also effectively buttressed critiques of heterosexual relationships being used as the standard and by which gay and lesbian relationships have been pushed to the deviant margins. So there is a lot of good in a constructionist approach. However, this is overshadowed by Rubin's support of pedophilia. Rubin posited that, quote, the notion that sex per se is harmful to the young has been chiseled into extensive social and legal structures designed to insulate minors from sexual knowledge and experience. Close quote. Rubin is not celebrating the slow enactment of laws designed to protect children from sexual abuse. She is decrying them. Similar to Hawkingham in conversation with Foucault, Rubin argued for the legalization of child abuse imagery. She asserted that, quote, although the Supreme Court has also ruled that it is a constitutional right to possess obscene material for private use, some child pornography laws prohibit even the private possession of any sexual material involving minors. Close quote. According to Rubin, restricting child pornography is actually an attack on sexual civil liberties. Rubin claimed that, quote, the laws produced by the child porn panic are ill-conceived and misdirected. They represent far-reaching alterations in the regulation of sexual behavior and abrogate important sexual civil liberties, close quote. If sirens were not already blaring, Rubin then supports NAMBLA, the North American Man-Boy Love Association, describing how, quote, Hardly anyone noticed as child sexual abuse legislation swept through Congress and state legislatures. With the exception of the North American Man-Boy Love Association, boy lovers, also known as adult men who sexually abuse male children, and American Civil Liberties Union, no one raised a peep of protest. Close quote. 
Could it be that there was not much opposition to the laws other than from pedophiles because most people think child abuse is wrong? The fact that the majority of people and state legislatures position the sexual abuse of children as wrong means that postmodern and queer theory will champion it. The driving force of the philosophy is the challenge to social norms which are framed as bad because they are norms and the liberating of that which is considered a deviant sexuality. Subsequently, Rubin described adult men who sexually abuse male children as having a, quote, erotic orientation, close quote, which must be defended. Rubin claimed that because these adult men sexually abuse boys, quote, the police have feasted on them, close quote, and that in 20 years it will be much easier to show that these men have been the victims of a savage and undeserved witch hunt. A lot of people will be embarrassed by their collaboration with this persecution. Alongside portraying pedophilia as a persecuted sexuality, Rubin is throwing the wrong side of history argument commentators such as Owen Jones are so fond at leveling at women defending reality and sex-based rights. Rubin consistently compares objection to pedophilia with objection to homosexuality. She argues that child protection laws are akin to anti-gay legislation. This constant linking of homosexuality with child abuse like they are one and the same is something I find disgusting about this scholar's work. The librarians of the University of Illinois have claimed that Rubin demonstrated in her essay, quote, the way that certain sexual expressions are made more valuable than others and that by doing that, allowing those who are outside these parameters to be oppressed, close quote. Pedophilia is morphed by Rubin into an oppressed sexuality. Rubin considers that, quote, the most despised sexual cases currently include transsexuals, transvestites, fetishists, sadomasochists, sex workers such as prostitutes and porn models, and the lowliest of all, those whose eroticism transgresses generational boundaries. Close quote. Rubin's statement highlights how the attempt to normalize and liberate pedophilia by linking it with the normalization of transvestitism, fetishists, sadomasochists, and sex workers has been going on for 20 years. Rubin complained that at the time of writing in the DSM-3, quote, fetishism, sadism, masochism, transsexuality, transvestitism, exhibitionism, voyeurism, and pedophilia are quite firmly entrenched as psychological malfunctions, close quote. Rubin celebrated that, quote, sexualities keep marching out of the diagnostic and statistical manual and onto the pages of social history. At present, several other groups are trying to emulate the successes of homosexuals. Bisexuals, sadomasochists, individuals who prefer cross-generational encounters, pedophiles, transsexuals, and transvestites are all in various states of community formation and identity acquisition. Close quote. Rubin's work, a seminal piece for queer theory, underscores how there is an agenda. That line, sadomasochists, individuals who prefer cross-generational encounters, obscures the horror of what she wants to normalize. She is describing people who torture and sexually abuse children. Rubin continues to bemoan that, quote, the law is especially ferocious in maintaining the boundary between childhood innocence and adult sexuality, close quote. One would have thought this was a positive thing. Well, not in queer theory. It should be noted how Rubin has put innocence in inverted commas. This makes the claim that children themselves are active and desiring of their own abuse. In this, we might detect the ripples of Foucault's thought. Finally, Rubin denounces how, quote, adults who deviate too much from conventional standards of sexual conduct are often denied contact with the young, even their own, close quote. In other words, the legislation that prohibits pedophiles from working with children, for example, is oppressive state force, according to queer theorists, such as Rubin. That Rubin feels like this is unsurprising. The dismantling of laws and cultural norms which prohibit free sexual reign, such as pedophilia, and the removal of boundaries which restrict male sexual access is the motivation of queer theory. One queer theorist who was and is potentially placed on an even higher pedestal than Rubin by adherence to queer theory is Pat Califia, Rubin's former lover. Professor of English at Cardiff University, Alessandra Tanassini has outlined how, quote, Butler, 1990, and Sedgwick, 2008, are often thought of as the founding statements in the field of queer theory. But equally important is Califia, 2000, which offers a radical libertarian defense of sadomasochism, intergenerational sex, and pornography. Close quote. There it is, bold as brass, through the works of Califia 
sadomasochism, pedophilia, and pornography are recognized as foundational to queer theory. It is of note that academics are aware that Califia promoted pedophilia, but do not deem this a problem and continue to teach her his works to students as a brave new way of thinking. Linda Lemonchek is similarly laudatory, recommending, quote, for an excellent overview of the sex radical position on pedophilia, sadomasochism, and other patterns of sexual difference, see Pat Califia, Public Sex, close quote. So on Lemonchek's advice, it is to Califia's public sex which we now turn. Pat Califia, a titan of queer theory, consistently advocated for the legalization and normalization of pedophilia. Pat Califia Califia described public sex as representing the bulk of my nonfiction work from 1979 to the present. That's a decade and a half of fuming and fussing about sexual repression and censorship bragging about my search for ever more forbidden ways to have an orgasm. Sounds exciting. However, it is early on in the text when Califia introduces the ideas of a, quote, transgender lesbian, a lesbian with a penis, and cross-generational sex, close quote, also known as pedophilia. Califia then quotes Jonathan Katz, a queer academic and activist, and Jeffrey Weeks, and normalizes pedophilia, claiming that their works were especially helpful and informative. To make it clear who Califia was learning from, here is Weeks being acknowledged by the former vice chair of Pedophilia Information Exchange, PIE, Warren Middleton, in a pro-pedophilia text. In the article, No Minor Issues, Age of Consent, Child Pornography, and Cross-Generational Relationships, written in 2000, Califia admits that she, he, thought that all age-of-consent laws should be repealed. Califia then details the availability of child abuse imagery and bemoans the 1977 passage of federal laws against child abuse imagery, which would have guaranteed that it would disappear from the shelves of adult bookshelves. Who is saddened that child sex abuse imagery would be harder to access? Califia expressed a dismay that anti-porn feminists and anti-gay cops and politicians continued to speak about the growing menace of child pornography. Those awful anti-porn feminists campaigning against child sexual abuse. How devilish. Califia then attempted to present objections to pedophilia as a form of homophobia and complained that in the late 70s, Child porn and statutory rape laws were disproportionately enforced against gay men who had sex with adolescent males, otherwise known as children. If it sounds like you've heard this story before, remember, we are currently watching feminists being attacked and labeled transphobic for supporting child safeguarding. To return to the past, Califia celebrated that she, he, knew several gay men who proudly call themselves boy lovers that she, he, socially mixed with pedophiles and described sexual abuse as erotic initiation. To repeat, this is one of the people considered a titan of queer theory. Significantly, Califia argued that what the cops called protecting children looked like repression of queer youth. These arguments are back, as we see child safeguarding policies described as transphobia. As we see in current transgender debates, the goalposts were then shifted. On page 59, Califia compares teenagers having sex with each other to adults sexually abusing children. Califia compared opposition to teaching children and teenagers that pedophilia was an acceptable, if not potentially desirable, sexual experience to abstinence-only sex education pushed by the Christian right wing. Surely there is a middle position. Feminists managed to argue for sex and relationship education without promoting pedophilia to children and teenagers. Queer theory is a philosophy of straw man arguments which all come around eventually to the child deciding to be abused. Alongside her his pro-pedophilia arguments published in public sex throughout her his career, Califia consistently advocated for the legalization and normalization of pedophilia. Califia's argument, Feminism, Pedophilia, and Children's Rights, first published in the now-banned pedophile magazine Paedica, is currently hosted on a pro-pedophilia website. Califia was not only aware but excited that her his work would be published in a European journal for pedophilia. Califia stated that this piece will be translated into Dutch and published abroad in a special issue of Paedica on women and pedophilia, and that I support Paedica and enjoy working with the editors of this special issue.
there you go, Califia, considered a titan of queen theory, publicly stated that she he supports pedophiles. At least Califia, unlike Rubin, admitted that most gay and lesbian people do not want to have anything to do with child sexual abuse in his her declaration that she he knew that she he probably could not get anything on this topic published today in the American gay and lesbian press. Califia set the tone for the article from the off, explaining that, In 1980, I published a two-part article in The Advocate critiquing American age of consent laws, thus assisting an Overton window shift. When queer theory converges with legislation, this seems reasonable. Commenting on the reason feminists abhor Califia, Sheehy lamented that Doc and Fluff, my recent science fiction novel, has been banned by some women's bookstores because it supposedly depicts a cross-generational lesbian relationship, and I've been attacked as an advocate of child molestation in the feminist press. Notice that term again, cross-generational. That's what I hear. Alarm bells. Califia argued that the American government's campaign against the sexual rights of young people has been so successful that most gay men, lesbian, and feminists are convinced that the movement to repeal age of consent laws was nothing more than an attempt to guarantee rapacious adults the right to vulnerable child victims. Yes, correct. However, most people and feminists understand the harms of child sexual abuse without being taught about it by the American government. Califia claimed that in its refusal to accept NAMBLA in its movement, the adult gay community here has cut off its next generation. Nope. It is protecting children from sexual abuse, period. Califia posited that, I know very few lesbians and even fewer gay men who waited until they were 18 to come out. Age of coming out shouldn't open one up to sexual abuse. It is noteworthy that Califia doesn't critique that gay and lesbians have to come out because heterosexuality is culturally held as normal. Califia then argued that child sexual abuse is desired by the child, claiming that, quote, most of us were aware well before puberty that we wanted to be close to or sexual with members of our own sex, close quote. Califia griped that, most American gay rights activists and lesbian feminists display suspicion and hatred towards pedophilia. Yes, t correct. Finally, a queer theorist has admitted that pedophilia is unwelcome in the rainbow. Queer theorists such as Califia reframed feminism as a social purity movement due to feminism's defense of women and girls' boundaries. Califia asserted that the feminist anti-porn movement mirrored a growing conservatism in American society about all sexual matters. As economic conditions here got worse, people began to look towards traditional values to provide a feeling of security and safety. The connotations and connections Califia was drawing are clear. Califia lamented that her his feminist critics have characterized her him as a pervert and advocate of rape, battery, and child abuse. Well, if you don't wish to be characterized as such, don't advocate it. Nevertheless, Califia, as a proponent of queer theory, will necessarily have to support the queering of sexual boundaries as good in of itself. Indeed, the two theories, feminism and queer, are totally opposed. Califia and queer theory was not only attacked by feminists, but is so obviously morally bankrupt that even the enemies of feminism, conservatives, expressed similar sentiments. Califia responded to these critics that, quote, the panic over child pornography and pedophilia that has racked American society since the 70s is an inseparable part of our society's denial of the shortcomings and failures of the family. Close quote. No, I don't get the link either. Nor is her his statement justified in the text. Califia's argument that many children are murdered by their families does not explain why child pornography is not bad. Hint, child pornography is bad and Califia is wrong. Califia then attempted to align pro-pedophilia and queer theory with genuinely progressive movements. Califia argued that moral crusades have also been used to attack both feminism and gay rights, and neither of these progressive movements has been very successful at defending itself against such attacks or at presenting a complete analysis of them. Despite the previous condemnation of feminism and the admittance that advocating for child sexual abuse is unwelcome and unconnected with the gay and lesbian rights movement, queer theory, as propounded by Califia, continued to cloak itself under feminism and the rainbow. Reminiscent of the radio broadcast of a conversation between Foucault, Hockingham, and Danae, 
and in the works of Rubin, Califia argued for the legalization and normalization of child sex abuse imagery. Califia complained that child pornography has been a special category in American law since 1977 and argued that homophobia, particularly the legal campaign by Anita Bryant, is the reason that child sex abuse imagery is banned. Once again, a queer theorist linked gay rights with the right to sexually abuse children. It was and is an appalling argument to make. In the next section, Califia tried to minimize the damage child sexual abuse causes by describing it as kiddie porn. Let us call it what it is, the rape and abuse of a child inflicting horrific pain. In one of the only sections of Califia's work which I can discern any innovative arguments, Califia claimed that the post office was targeting gay people in a huge conspiracy. It is quite the read. According to Califia, the American government and feminists were not trying to remove the scourge of child abuse imagery, but were rather endeavoring to enforce traditional values and social purity. This is a giant of queer theory. Califia, in her his various arguments, suggested that feminists are in league with the post office in a grand homophobic conspiracy. Califia complained that, quote, the post office targets people who are unlucky enough to have landed on mailing lists compiled by U.S. Customs. These lists come from many sources. When adult porn businesses are raided, the authorities also confiscate their mailing lists. The post office and customs keep track of people who order sexually explicit material through the mail. Police have even confiscated the membership list of a gay computer bulletin board that was shut down because its operator was accused of violating age of consent laws. The post office then conducts direct mail campaigns soliciting orders for child porn. Law enforcement officials sometimes become pen pals, pretending to be pedophiles or sexually active children, and solicit their correspondents to send or receive child porn through the mail. If targeted individuals seize the bait, they are arrested. Yes, Califia thinks that the arrest of pedophiles is the problem. Califia objected that, quote, American society has become rabidly phobic about any sexual contact between adults and minors. Close quote. The use of the term phobic is striking. This casts opposition to child sexual abuse as based on an irrational fear, with the problem being placed squarely with those who object. To reinforce this reframing of objections to child sexual abuse as hysterical throughout the article and without signal, Califia switched between talking about the sexual abuse of children and teenage sexual activity. This was a calculated attempt to obscure the argument that adults should be allowed to have sex with children. In another move of concealment, Califia claimed that, quote, lesbian feminism supposedly empowers women, but we are reluctant to see young women's sexual experiences as anything but victimization, close quote. Califia is arguing that young girls should be seen as agents in their own abuse, masking the fact that 98% of sexual abusers are male and the majority are heterosexual. This is what queer theory does. It obfuscates victim and abuser. It renames abuse as agency, and when that cloaking doesn't work, it resorts to the notion originally espoused by Foucault that power exists through discourse and there is no reality outside the narrative. Queer theory is more smoke and mirrors than philosophy. Poof, abuse has disappeared. As predictable as the sun will rise, Califia made the argument that opposing adults sexually abusing those under the age of consent is ageism. Califia contended that, quote, we give lip service to confronting ageism, but we do not really include underage lesbian and bisexual women in our community, close quote. Califia tried to muddle the matter yet again by obscuring the fact that 98% of people that sexually abuse children are male. Califia appealed to the sentiment and argued that, quote, adolescent dykes should experiment sexually and romantically with each other, but when they are trapped in schools, neighborhoods, where being called queer targets them for harassment and assault, how many young lesbians can afford to come out or seek others like themselves, close quote. Rather than target the culture of bullying and non-acceptance, Califia targets age of consent laws and child protection. Go figure. After spending an entire article bemoaning state interference in the lives of citizens and child sexual activity, Califia then makes a remarkable volte face. Califia proposed that, quote, the state is not willing to take the radical action that would be necessary to protect child victims of abusive adults, 
That would mean challenging parents' ownership of their children. It would mean providing viable alternatives to the family. Close quote. That statement is chilling. Califia is sick of parents safeguarding their children from sexual abuse and proposes a loss of custody. This sudden reversal regarding state intervention highlights the hollowness of queer theory and its shifting principles. Queer theory contorts and warps to advance men's sexual rights by any argument necessary. The online pedophile collective have provided a hopeful afternote. They report that, quote, in Pat Califia's second edition of Public Sex, The Culture of Radical Sex, she expresses a sad change in stance. As of 2000, she no longer accepts prepubescent children's and many young teenagers' possibility to consent to erotic or sexual contacts with adults. She has become much more cynical about adults and their ability to listen to children, and now as a parent, she thinks more in terms of making the child's welfare a priority than of consent. Close quote. The phrase, making the child's welfare a priority than of consent, to me, suggests that Califia and the Pedophile Collective recognize the harm and that any consent is coerced and illusionary. Nevertheless, queer theory's influence has poisoned a wave of feminism. For example, Sarah Beresford's inability to break free from queer theory led her to question whether age-of-consent laws were protectionist and concede that the current law surrounding the age of consent not only denies the agency of girls and boys under the age of 16, but also places them in a position of non-autonomous passivity. This underscores how destructive and hollow a philosophy queer theory is. Queer theory is the ultimate backlash against feminism. Judith Butler Judith Butler, modern queer theory guru, defended incest and struggled to understand feminist notions of consent. Judith Butler Taking over the baton to captain this backlash against feminism, was the high priestess of queer theory gibberish, Judith Butler, who unsurprisingly defended incest. Furthermore, she did this without making a single reference to the fact that most familial child sex abuse is by a male relative to a female child. Rather, she used queer theory to claim that by denying incest and legislating against it, states were enforcing heterosexuality. In her triumph and magnum opus of flimflam, gender trouble, Butler postulated that, quote, the incest taboo is the juridical law that is said both to prohibit incestuous desires and to construct certain gendered subjectivities through the mechanism of compulsory identification. But what is to guarantee the universality or necessity of this law? Close quote. The necessity of the law against incest is the harm that child sexual abuse, and in particular interfamilial child sexual abuse, does to the young survivor. The law is also necessary because of the prevalence. A study by the Office of the Children's Commissioner in the United Kingdom found that there is considerable evidence to suggest that a substantial amount of child sexual abuse is committed by close relatives or those known to the victim. Victims can be both boys and girls, but the majority of victims are known to be girls. Close quote. The researchers for the Office of the Children's Commissioner further delineated from recent evidence that the typical young person with sexually harmful behavior is a white male who commits interfamilial child sexual abuse against female and male children who are family members. These young white male sexual abusers and rapists will grow to become adult male rapists and can count on the support of queer theorists championing their transgression of sexual boundaries and norms. This is one of the reasons this men's sexual rights movement, queer theory, is diametrically opposed to feminism. The recognition and then cultural and legal prohibition against incest as a form of child sexual abuse was a cause championed by second-wave feminists, the ones branded TERFs now. Luis Armstrong has analyzed how the issue of incest was born of the women's movement in the United States, which is a political issue, an issue of violence towards women and children an issue that belongs to feminism. Similarly, Gillian Harkins has outlined how feminist researchers broke the silence of this patriarchal conspiracy when they documented incest as a common form of child sexual abuse. The next step was to use this research to intervene in the criminal justice and child protective domains. Prior to feminist agitation in the 1970s, incest had been treated as an isolated breach of proper alliance and normative conduct. 
it was covered by marital law rather than rape. The recoding of incest as rape by feminists is what Butler and other queer theorists are fighting against. As well as opposing the legal strictures against intrafamiliar child sexual abuse, Butler claimed that the law against incest produces incest and the desire to sexually abuse children. Butler reasoned regarding the incest taboo that, quote, not only does that taboo forbid and dictate sexuality in certain forms, but it produces a variety of substitute desires and identities, close quote. How does Butler reach this argument? Well, as she explains, quote, if we extend the Foucauldian critique to the incest taboo, the taboo might be understood to create and sustain for the mother-father as well the compulsory replacement of that desire, close quote. Butler has obscured the fact that in the majority of incestuous child sexual abuse, the perpetrators are male relatives sexually abusing female children. She has pushed the desire for abuse onto the child. American research has shown that the younger the victim, the more likely it is that the abuser is a family member, and that of those molesting a child under six, 50% were family members. Family members also accounted for 23% of those abusing children ages 12 to 17. Despite these facts, Butler promoted, quote, the legitimacy and legality of public zones of sexual exchange, intergenerational sex, adoption outside marriage, increased research and testing for AIDS and transgender politics. Close quote. This is an example of how queer theorists sandwich advocacy for pedophilia or incest in between legitimate arguments for advancing gay and lesbian rights. This is done in order to legitimize the arguments for child sexual abuse and make them harder to fight. Butler's thoughts on sexual consent should be read with her defense of incest in mind. Butler proposed in general terms that consent was problematic because sometimes, quote, they have consented but do not like that they have, close quote. This is gold standard victim blaming and denies the feminist concept of an ongoing negotiated consent. Children may consent to activities because they do not understand the implications, have been coerced, groomed, or simply because of the power differences between the child and an older adult. Children are socially groomed to do what they are told if the instruction is from an authority figure such as a parent. Consent is illusionary. Although talking about sexual consent, Butler spent the explanatory paragraph thinking about consent as walking through a door to an analyst's office and argued that, quote, in other words, since someone may have issues with consent that become material within an analytic session, that person has also set up the problem of transference by consenting to walk through the door into the analyst's office, close quote. I would argue that sexual consent and consent to physically enter one's body is not marginally, but overwhelmingly different to consent to enter a counseling session. Arguing cross-purpose is a common tactic of Butler and other queer theorists to confuse the reader and mask what they are really saying. The idea Butler proposes, quote, that the person has also set up the problem of transference by consenting to walk through the door into the analyst's office, close quote, cannot be considered feminist. In contrast to Butler, feminists argue that just because one has walked through the door, that does not mean all consent is transferred. One has consented to specific acts, and the consent can end at any time. Butler is foundational to queer theory and shines a light on how anti-feminist queer theory is. 